So yeah, welcome. Thanks everyone for coming to my talk. Um, excited to be here and uh, I've heard some interesting talks today. I'm hoping to deliver some insight and perspective to you all as well in the next 30 minutes. So um, I don't usually put the word numerical computing in the slides or in my titles because it tends to scare people away. But this seems like a pretty technical crowd and it certainly is the heart of what I think makes sort of the coming wave of AI ML applications and securing them particularly challenging. So um, for those uh, who um, don't know me, I'm Peter Wang. I'm the founder and uh, now the chief AI officer. I've been the CTO, the CEO, and now I'm the chief AI officer at Anaconda. Um, I'm actually not formally trained as a computer scientist. I was a physics guy, and then I ended up, I mean, I always love software, love Linux, love doing you know, all these kind of computer things, and I ended up in the software industry, but I ended up doing software as a consultant, really focused on numerical computing, and that's how I ended up in the uh, scientific Python space, which then uh, you know, we created an Iconda and then and sort of worked on from there. So these are just some of the perspectives that I've learned. And what's interesting is for me, the things that I learned doing scientific computing, doing numerical computing, doing consulting around that, I realized that I had a different perspective on the world than like the Java and C Sharp and C++ people going through traditional either server-side applications or you know, business applications and things like that. So um, for those who don't know Anaconda, we've been around about 12 years. Uh, my co-founder is the creator of NumPy and SciPy, and he and I started the company because we really saw an opportunity 12 years ago to take this kind of nerdy Python numerical stack and take it into business computing and really transform uh, what was, at that time, I think the sexy term was big data. But we see that big data would, would require a lot of interesting compute in order to ask big questions. And so we pushed Python into the business world, into sort of the uh, out of the scientific world, scientific computing world, into the world of business data analysis. And over the last 12 years, we've We've invested um, north of $30 million into just legit open source software development, whether it's fundamental tools like Conda, which you would expect we would invest in, but also lots of new and interesting things like PyScript, which is a WebAssembly uh, Python integration. Little tools like Beware, which let you write Python and then deploy natively onto mobile, iOS, or, or Android. Um, and all sorts of interesting little bits and pieces here and there. Um, some of which get used quite a bit, some of which don't get used very much, but get used by very interesting people doing interesting problems. Uh, and we're just really proud to have been part of this large community and, and pushing it forward. So um, over the last 12 years, we've, come, uh, we've become somewhat of a standard name if people are running to Python and doing numerical Python stuff out in the wild. We've partnered with a lot of businesses who need to have a vendor to support their use of the Wild West open source software landscape that is Python. Um, and so we have a, actually a very large reach. What's interesting is that you know, most of the startups, most companies that you look at, um, they tend to go into a very cloud native SaaS uh, uh, sort of approach. And we are actually one of the very few companies that do what would be traditionally called a shrink wrap or a software download kind of approach, right, from like the 80s or 90s. So we're really, I think, best known for our, uh, uh, our one-click software download that gives you all these out-of-the-box pre-built uh, Python tools for doing data analysis, ML, AI, and visualization. So let's get into it. Numerical computing. All right, how many people here know something about numerical computing? Not very many, right? Okay, great. So let's see, uh, let's get right into it then. So what is unique about numerical computing? Why is it challenging? You know, why is it different? Why do we call it something different than normal computing? And this is just my take, but you know, feel free to disagree. But, but as I've thought about this over the years, I think the best way to distinguish it from traditional software development is that if I'm thinking like a traditional software developer, um, when I'm writing code, I'm really thinking about, you know, is this code correct? That question of correctness is really rooted in um, you know, preconditions, postconditions. What do I want to transform? What does the input data schema look like? What am I trying to, you know, what is the business mo model or the business logic I'm trying to model? So these are the kinds of constraints or the kinds of concerns that inform the question of correctness for a piece of code. Um, and generally, when it comes to actually intersecting with data itself, most of the code we write, we try to be relatively independent of data values, and mostly we're thinking about data types. Now, of course, data types do have ranges on the values, but very seldom do you write business logic that works for half of the integers and then breaks at some random integers, right? You either work across in 32 or UN32 or you don't, right? So this is the kind of thing that generally when we write software for traditional software development, we are thinking about correctness in that way. We really actually are relatively value independent. And the algorithms, now the CS nerds of the room may disagree with me, but most of the algorithms we actually implement in business practice are pretty standard. I mean, how many of you have implemented Red Black Tree from scratch for a good reason, right? 
not very many. Most of the times, if there are obscure, weird things, if there's a, you know, A-star uh, search or if there's some other kind of thing, we are usually relegating those or we're encapsulating them into well-defined pieces of software that have a battery of tests around them, and we take them, whether they're from the open source, uh, you know, here's someone who has made this particular kind of solver or has a file system, which has a particular indexing sort of approach, or we buy it from a vendor, here's a database, or here's some particular caching thing that knows something about the hardware. So the algorithms are pretty straightforward, except when they're not. In those cases, they're well encapsulated with good APIs, and we sort of get them from a, a third party. OK, now, compared to numerical computing, like a lot of these things change. And the really big difference is with numerical computing, the values themselves can actually affect whether your thing is correct or not. There are entire classes of algorithms which might just be fine, but they're totally wrong to use when trying to solve a particular kind of a problem. And multiple things factor into correctness. Correctness now becomes, gains a few additional dimensions. You know, the value dependency is one of them. Um, and the performance varies wildly, because many of the kinds of algorithms that we're dealing with in numerical computing, they are, they are stochastic algorithms, so they're probabilistic algorithms. They're simulated annealing, and there's some kind of variational convergence. And so you have these external sort of um, constraints you're trying to optimize towards, and the performance of your code, the code correctness is dependent on the input values, the particular thing you're simulating for, and the amount of hardware you have, so there's a hardware dependency. All of these things, performance is an aspect of correctness. Correctness depends on values themselves, data values. The algorithms are hardware dependent, and the algorithms can be complex, as in there is no known closed form solution. You just have to try a bunch of heuristics, right? That's the kind of thing we run into in numerical computing all the time. And even when we, you know, when we go into the most rigorous environments, supercomputers connected with InfiniBand that cost the public $100 million, we are throwing these kinds of algorithms at them. And the thing I did put on here is, on the left, you know, you have these encapsulated, these, these high-end algorithms are encapsulated into, uh, you know, pieces that we can, we can borrow from other people, we can buy from other people. On the right, numerical computing, usually these complex algorithms are implemented by grad students running on caffeine, and they have left, and you cannot get a hold of them anymore. So that is the sad reality of the world over numerical computing. And so the open source world around numerical computing has emerged um, in, a, in a sort of different way. Like I, I'm an open source nerd from like the 90s, and I remember uh, you know uh, all the all the greats back then talking about how you know open source you scratch your own itch, and that and then you find other people on the internet who itch in the same way, and you guys get together on a mailing list, and now you have a piece of open source code. But on the scientific computing side, you just find beleaguered refugees who get together and and, and certain random meetups and certain mailing lists. That none of them are trained. Developers, they are just hacking Fortran and C, um, and they have you know a bunch of I/O in the middle of a hot for loop because nobody told them differently, and so they're doing all this stuff though because the CS nerds are, are making too much money starting things like Google, and they really can't be bothered to learn differential equations and any of this other high-end stuff that, that you do with Fortran. So. The open source community, though, did actually start gravitating, the open source numerical computing community started gravitating around Python. And this question of uh, Python, you know, some of you may have a love-hate relationship with it. Many of you may detest it. I've certainly run into lots of people who have very strong feelings against Python. But what I will say is what I find that people like about Python over the years, the thousands and thousands of people I've talked to who like it, you know, like it for these kinds of reasons. And I think these are some of the reasons why Python does get adopted quite a bit. But there's another really interesting reason, in particular relative to, to the numerical computing side, which is that the Python VM is incredibly simple, as VMs go, simple design. It really is a C library, which means that these grad students and, and assistant professors, they um, don't know any better than to go and write all sorts of weird things that attach to those API hooks inside the Python C library, uh, libpython, essentially. And so it's a, I call it a Honda Civic, because it's so approachable here. It's, it's anyone can drive it. It's Honda Civic, but it's got these mounting bolts, and, and then we somehow put like warp drive on it, right? And, uh, and that's what's now propelled Python into, of course, um, the, the number one language, if you, depending who you ask, the number one language in the world because people are using it for ML, AI, data science, and all these things. Um, and the, and the, the thing to also be aware of, and well, neither here nor there, but something I like to just point out when I can, is that as a language, Python hits very, very different kinds of demographics of users that most, most programming languages are used by people who write code, who view themselves as coders. Python is mostly written by people who do not self-identify as coders. They write code to get to some kind of a result, right? The code is just a means to an end. So <laughs> the other question then, so this now dovetails and segues into 
why is Python packaging such a horrible mess? Why is it such a disaster, right? Because this directly comes from this. If you have mounting bolts for warp drives and mounting bolts for grad student code in Fortran, you're going to end up with a packaging uh, and distribution nightmare, right? So um, if you look at, again, just to, just to reiterate that point, the great, Python, the great power of the Python ecosystem comes from its adaptability and connectivity to native non-Python code. And it has way more of this going on than any of the other uh, any of the other language ecosystems, right? Most of the other language ecosystems end up having some, you know some connectivity with an accelerator here, maybe a fast query optimizer here, maybe some SSL libraries for security and things like that. But the level of amateurs slapping C and C++ code into the language itself, Python just has way way more of that, right? Um, so that means we inherit 50 years of terribleness and broken abstractions, literally 50 years. And so, so that's, that's why as, as someone who accidentally ended up in the business of compiling Python extensions and distributing them, like we have just so many of these wonderful lessons that compiling code is hard, but compiling other people's code is something I won't say here because we're being recorded. But, but what you learn is, of course, all these things which are being talked about in a conference like this, right? The build environment matters tremendously. The hardware dependency and the runtime environment explosion means that you have to make this trade-off of, do I target? What version of a chip instruction set do I target? Right? Most of your standard vanilla web serving, web front end code that you know, you know, does a CRUD out of a database and puts a row to another database, it doesn't really care if a particular chip has AVX 512 or has SSD 2. You, you, don't, you don't care, right? But when you write this kind of stuff, it could be 2x, 4x, 10x your performance, right? And depending on how much cash, how much L3 is available on, an, on a GPU, sorry, on a CPU, depending on how much L3 is on there, you may actually want to use a different algorithm. This is the kind of thing that ends up like plaguing this ecosystem of, of, of tools that are in the Python ecosystem. And so most people don't care about any of this, by the way. They just want it to work. Again, they're not software devs. They're not software nerds. They didn't get a CS degree. They just want to import some library they read about in a blog post and run it in a Jupyter Notebook and have it work. So there's all sorts of fun little things. I don't know how many of you have heard about this one. Um, this is the kind of nightmare you run into. So this is a little bit, if you, trigger warning, you guys might see some stuff that causes you to start convulsing. But there was a bug in GCC that would cause a numerical precision flag to be set and then fail to be unset. So depending on your import order, if you imported a busted or a library that was compiled with the buggy version of GCC, then every other numerical procedure you ran afterwards would start squashing subnormals. And you have a very simple test case you can write where depending on the import order, you end up with a zero instead of whatever, 1.4 to times 10 to the negative 45th, right? So this is the kind of thing which you might say, well, who cares about 1.4 times 10 to the negative 38th or 34, 45th or whatever? Well, um, there's a little thing called um, LLMs, which are all made of large matrices, oftentimes with very, very small values in the edges. And multiplying those together and adding them up turns out to be really important. So that's just one example. If you're doing engineering simulation, if you're doing wing airflow simulation, all these things matter tremendously. And this is a horrible, horrible bug to run into. And you catch it somewhere in the middle of the supply chain. Now, this is a bug. Someone caught it. Imagine if this was an attack, right? Every bug is an attack surface. Um, so here, like, this is a fun thing. A, well, I guess this actually names the vendor. But in any case, a vendor decided to delete a binary symbol in a, uh, a third-party, non-open source uh, library that they provided, and that ended up breaking up a lot of downstream stuff. You know? And so the downstream stuff decides, oh, we're going to vendor the world. We'll just pull everything in and statically link against them. That's also not great, because you actually want to have transparency into what are your dependencies. right? Um, there's fun things like this. At runtime, turning a hex string into another shared library that you load into the runtime environment. That's great. Um, and so this is, uh, yeah, this is just kind of the stuff that you run into when you have a couple hundred thousand libraries in an open ecosystem. Um, there's other things like this which are not really WTFs as much as just like nightmares. Um, so if you want to do some data, uh, some geo data, geospatial data processing, you'll probably run into a library called GDAL. It's a very popular, very common tool for you know, converting different formats, and there's tons of data formats for looking at map data. And if you want to actually get stuff out of PDF, you have to build Chromium. You take a dependency on Chromium. Um, and there's all sorts of other stuff I don't want to give to you. There's stuff where, you know, depending on the, on the date at the build time, you might actually build differently. 
and that's because of um, uh, software patent issues. And so if you're building a particular library before a software patent is expired, then you would use this open source implementation here, but after that license expired, you would build against this thing over here. Okay, so you think about your software reproducibility, you think about supply chain vulnerability analysis, this is just all of these things should make your skin crawl, right? Um, there's just, uh, yeah, like there's many things as well where you, because people in Python use um, virtual environments and then we have all sorts of long path names in, toward, in order to embed all the different build configuration and platform architecture into the file name and then use the file name, of course, why wouldn't you use the file name of the tarball as a directory, you unzip into there, you start going down, down further and further and further, all of a sudden you run into the Windows um, path, path length limit, which depending on what how Windows is configured is 256, 260, or 32, 767 characters. So good luck. Um, and so this is the kind of stuff that we run into, and these are just a few of the wonderful little bits that make this hard. Because to kind of recap, um, there's a large, vast ecosystem of really weird and interesting code uh, written by people who are not themselves necessarily coders that are required and, in, and, and they want to be used by other people who are also not software nerds. And it sits on top of 50 years of stuff that just happens to be around, whatever, on a department machine that somebody compiled and linked against. So this is kind of what we run into. It is absolutely a flaming dumpster fire, except it, it sort of fuels <laughs> so much of what happens in, in modern computing. Um, and so this is one of the reasons why we built Conda, was we wanted to make sure that people of, of, of whatever stripe, students, professionals, they could just get all the bits and pieces of, of the, the open source software stack. So you can think of it as a uh, Pythonic, Python-oriented kind of Nix, or you can think of it as a, um, a cross-platform RPM kind of approach, uh, where we're really packaging not just Python, but we package all the dependencies upstream of Python as well, including GDAL, including Chromium, including GHC and Haskell. We package all of that so that when an end user wants to go and grab something, they get all the bits and pieces, but if they're doing this in an enterprise environment, all those pieces are there invisible, so IT can come and scan and look at it, and that's actually one of our, one of our products, is that when people just go and download all this stuff, because these are end users, they're not software developers, they don't know Agile, they don't know what anything to mean, they're just trying to run some Python code in a notebook. Um, and they're just getting it from whatever, right? Because they might just grab it from an FTP site, they might pip install something, um, they might get it from an actual distribution vendor like us, who tests and curates some of the compatibilities, but whatever happens, they end up with a collection of this stuff on their machines, and enterprises have no visibility into this. Enterprises, they don't even know how many Python users they have, because you know, they can talk to the IT groups who are writing code, but then you know, the VP of marketing is learning how to do AI, ML, some PyTorch stuff on their work laptop. So, um, so we have a product really to help with this problem, um, to, to give people sort of a central point of control, to filter on various things. This is not really a product shield. I just want to let people know there is some kind of a solution we're trying to put in place for this kind of thing. And this you know, works with our packaging technology, Conda. It also works with PIP, which is the, you know, the, 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 the more popular one that everyone uses for the non-native compiled dependencies. Um, but it really helps people get a visibility into what, what, is, what all is actually in their environments. Um, and then we have other tools as well. Again, not a product shill, just gonna skip over this one. But um, in my last few minutes here, just uh, talking about what, what comes next, right? Why, why am I interested in this topic uh, and why do I think it's so important? Well, when we're talking about, in a conference like this, we're talking about supply chain security, we're talking about all these different things, uh, things like build, like SBOMs and, 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 uh, and the build uh, pipeline and, and signing various pieces of the stages, all these kinds of things are good. I mean, they're, they're, they're great ideas. But I want to give people a bit of visibility into just how gnarly the stuff inside there actually is um, and, and how often we end up transporting binaries across that you really don't have a point of, pro you don't have a sense of provenance of it. Or you have um, irreproducibility. Oh, there's one that was here that was absolutely delicious. Did it link here? Oh, I, I got rid of it. Um, there was that one time where, um, there was, there's one funny one, maybe some of you remember this, the Debian one, where they were cleaning up a test, a test warning, a regression, about using um, uninitialized memory. And um, I think some security library was using that as a source of entropy. And the Debian maintainer kind of patched a thing in there and said, well, you're just accessing un un <laughs> uninitialized memory. We should initialize it to zeros. And that led to a security regression, right? Um, and so you think about how many of those kinds of things show up uh, in, the, in, the, in the build chain for stuff like this. Um, it's just, it's actually kind of a, a nightmare to think we can do any of it at all. 
Um, but the reason I bring all this up is this isn't just a bunch of rando like grad students in some engineering department messing around on a department computer. This stack is the foundations of AI. This stack is absolutely the foundations of modern data science, machine learning, and AI. It is driving not just a lot of different kinds of workloads, it's driving the most flops. Think about that for a second. What's driving the big, big, big stuff? Well, it doesn't take a lot more energy to go crank more rows out of Redis and then stick into a Mongo. That's been about the same for the last 10 years. This stuff is going and running at scale. People are, it's very easy for a VP of, of, of sales or for a risk you know, uh, auditor or somewhere at a bank to say, you know what, I want you to go, instead of, instead of back testing 10 years, back test 15. And instead, of, uh, instead of testing it at a resolution, a grid resolution of every week, do it every day. And now all of a sudden you've increased your, your compute footprint by how much, right? And so the kind of workloads, the kind of flops that are gonna be driven, that are driven every day through this stack of 50 years of Fortran C, C++, and grad student code, that is actually a huge part of the IT budget and will be even more of it moving forward. So for those of you who have kind of gone through this like data science, big data to data science, ML, ML ops, you know, DevSecOps, as you've made this transition and gone through this maturing of the enterprise landscape, um, it might be, if, you, if you've really beat your head into like configuring Python environments and trying to secure the Python open source stuff, you might wanna be like, oh, well, AI, this is great. AI is like the next thing. We don't have to worry about this anymore. Bad news, AI is just this but worse, right? You're gonna have to get, you have to actually get better at managing that because now you actually have to care about which version of a GPU you have. What version of CUDA worked with what version of a Linux kernel that IT approved for you to use? And that gives you what SLA? Because all of a sudden, these giant GPU farms multiplying giant matrices equals how many milliseconds on a response in a chatbot to a customer, right? So this is the kind of thing that this is actually converging and getting much more complicated for everyone. And uh, in some of the talks um, that I've seen today that talking about managing ML and AI uh, security, I, th I think I'm, I'm very encouraged to see that people recognize that versioning data, again, because this code is data dependent. Correctness is data dependent. You can't just check your code in a GitHub. You've got to actually do something about managing that data. And this is not data that you traditionally store in a database that's versioned, that you just pay you know, Oracle millions of dollars to help you manage. This is data that you generally throw in S3 bucket and you hope you never have to pay or you know, pay you know, every, for every incremental update to it, right? So this kind of data, these large, huge amounts of training data that we have to manually go and manage, curate, be able to hot fix on top of, we are talking about building enormously more complicated things. And so you have to get good at the data science software stack, that ML numerical Python software stack, in order to be good at the AI stack. Um, and that's, that's just gonna be what it is. And so I'm sorry I can't end on a good note other than all of you probably will have jobs for the next coming decade because this is real, right? I'm not going to go into all the AI ML attacks that I've seen, but there are definitely data poisoning attacks that are happening and they're gonna continue getting worse um, until people really step up. We're right now in like the Telnet era. If, you know, if you think about t back in the day when people would RSH and Telnet clear text passwords on hubs, not even switches, we're in that era of data management right now, right? There's data attacks where people are going and buying expired domains, stuffing bad data in them, hoping they get sucked up by the next crawl. There's these kinds of things that people are doing to actually poison data at the source. People are typo squatting, uh, what are they doing? They're typo squatting um, you know, Python package names on the Python package index, and then poisoning the training data sets for code and creating uh, code repositories with bogus import statements and environment YAMLs and everything in order to get the uh, LLMs to try to emit those pip install or con install commands to pick up the typo squatted thing. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that is happening as a multi-dimensional data plus code attack vector. Um, and that's just what I know about. I don't have any clearances. I'm just a dude who does this stuff. You think about state level actors and JITAN and the LibXZ attack and the social engineering of open source, the kinds of stuff where we're steering into, where we have zero visibility really into the data sets that go into training these large models, it's, it's really kind of a disastrous situation. So this is more of just an awareness and hoping to like open people's minds and thinking about the different dimensions of this stuff. I'm happy to talk with you all about any of this stuff. I think we have three more minutes for, uh, for questions. Um, but uh, yes, th that, that's my talk, by the way. So thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, 
So in numerical computing, have we tried using what? Big int, you mean like, um, well, we, uh, we use precisely as much integer as we need, generally, because it's expensive to use bigger ones. But I thought that was a joke. But yes, yeah, so there are, big, <laughs> there are big integer libraries, and there are people who use, you know, double, double, whatever. Like, they use very, very large ones. Uh, are you, do you mean something more specific than that, or? Um, I, in the numerical computing stuff that I've come across, generally not, because for the most part, um, there's very few things where you need to count that much stuff with that much precision. Well, it is, um, for the most part, all of this run, so the numerical codes in Python tend to go through, um, they, well, Python itself is interpreted, but the virtual machine has the ability to dispatch to compiled code, right? And that's what NumPy does, that's what SciPy does. Um, we have a library called Numba, which is a just-in-time compiler. Okay, great, yeah. So there's a lot of this kind of thing, right? And when you look at what, what PyTorch or TensorFlow or Jax do, there's a lot of this kind of stuff happening where Python, of course, the, on the label it says Python is an interpreted language running on the CPython VM, but in reality, a lot of this kind of heavy, heavy lifting goes through compiled code paths. You can, yes, Cython is a compiler, Numba is a compiler, there's many of these. The compilation can be expensive, but it, it, sometimes it's not, because the hot path can be compiled very quickly. And you know, the trade-off here always is between expressiveness and correctness and performance, right? So, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, but you're not gonna like the answer. <laughs> I'm not a popular guy when I talk about that. We have to actually have transparency on the input data. I mean, I don't, I don't know, like it's, maybe I'm just stupid, but like that seems like the obvious answer, right? If you don't want people poisoning crap, then don't make it a black box. But none of the AI, comp very few AI companies, I just say none, but very few frontier model uh, folks will even talk about what they use because there's a legal liability and risk around that. There's a few models that are actually transparent on their training data. The Allen Institute has one. Uh, I think IBM Graphite, they talk about the data they use as well. But when you actually go and look, all these people are trying to say, oh, we, have open, we love open source AI, we have all these open source AI open weight stuff. And you're like, yeah, but what data did you use? Well, our lawyers told us not to really talk too much about that, right? So if you actually want to stop that kind of attack, there is no other option than to be transparent about it. I think if, you know, as long as we don't have, as long as they feel at risk of legal exposure, if they talk about that, then um, what we'll probably end up having to have is some kind of a third party auditor that then is trusted and then is given the stamp of like, yes, you know, there's some kind of, you know, this kind of dance is always, always happens. And they can then audit those data sources. But see, the problem then, the problem is even then, auditing just what you say you used is not the same as, oh, I can guarantee that no intern or beleaguered person went and did a last minute data update 3 a.m. before the final training run kicked off, right? That's another thing you'd have to then affirm. And so all these affirmations, you have to have this very human approach to it because there isn't a way to walk backwards, right, and, and decompose and look at what the data had. At least with code, you could decompile code. Uh, even binaries, and say, well, this is jumping to that place, which definitely isn't the function it should have been doing. But with the LLMs, they're really these big, giant um, interpolator approximator engines. And so once you get all this data in there and it creates an embedding, how would you know that that particular vector had bad data? It's off by 0 .0001 in some vector over here, right? So that, that's my unfortunate answer, but I think that's the only honest answer that I can think of right now. Other questions? Yes. Um, can, can you, sorry, what does ISEC mean? <laughs> sorry, it's a dumb question. Uh-huh. Uh, 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 right.
That, yeah, that could be, that could be workable. That could be workable. Um, I'd have to think about that a little bit. I worry that the stakes are so large. There's so much at stake for these guys because there's not an otherwise economic moat, right? If you're open AI for Anthropic, I mean, uh, Meta is out there throwing out 400 billion parameter models. Um, so these, these people have a lot at stake. And of course, the people that, are, uh, that would otherwise uh, would, would have a claim if they could see the data and, and have any indication of data sets in there. It's, it's well-funded Hollywood, the entertainment industry. It's, it's a, you know, there's just a lot of dollars at stake on both sides. And so um, th that's what gives me pause when I think about that. Uh, but I do think that what we'll see, hopefully, what I push for as an open source guy is um, I really do think that we should be able to get much better performance with much less data, with just public available data. And so I'm deeply supportive of projects like Dolma and Olma from Allen Institute, um, projects like Eleuther, um, that are trying to build in the open and then try to have better and better algorithms running more efficiently to produce something approximating a frontier model. And I think we'll end up converging on that because then you can actually have some kind of legal clar clarity as to what this is, right? Um, anyway, there's a little pontificating on AI, but yeah. Any other questions? In the back, yes. Do you, mean, do you mean misinformation in the sense of it was an accidental hallucination? No, I mean like intentional misinformation in the data sets that would be picked up. Because I'm wondering if there's a way to kind of like prevent that from happening. Like Yeah, I mean, uh, misinformation, I think, in, the, in sort of the, 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 the vernacular connotation would be sort of, um, uh, it, you know, uh, untrue uh, facts about the world, right, or things like this. Is this kind of what you're referring to? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, because epistemologically, there are two different kinds of um, truth or verity that we're talking about, right? So we should maybe not use the word truth there. And what I would use is um, if we want to build a high-quality LLM and we define high-quality as when I ask it to generate code of a certain type, it generates with as great a probability as possible code which does that and does not expose, does not create vulnerabilities in the generated code. So if I define, so I have a very rigorous, so the purposes of using LLMs for coding or for assisting someone with a you know, command line and uh, system you know, system, uh, operations kind of tasks, um, we can define correctness or goodness or verity uh, on a somewhat objective scale, right? That if I actually generate some C code to do a for loop and you generate a backdoor for me, I would say that is lower quality than if you generated a C code that didn't have a backdoor, right? Uh, when it comes to the general purpose chatbot kind of function, and you're talking about answering people's questions about things that have uh, a broader diversity, let's say a wider epistemic reach, or, or di dynamic range, let's say, then the question of verity is, um, is a much more loaded one, right? Uh, because in some cases, you might say, well, I want my child to just know the simple thing, even though it's reductive and lacks color, they have a simple thing here, versus I want all of this context, which might be more true, but then is much more confusing for someone who doesn't have the context. So these are the kinds of things where it's not, when we talk about misinformation in the kind of political sense and the use of LLMs for that kind of a, a purpose, I would say that's a little bit outside of the scope of what I'm talking about here, where we do have a very well, I would say relatively well-defined objective verity kind of concept, right, that we can be honing these towards. But the answer to your question, though, is actually the same for both, which is absolutely yes. You have to filter on the inputs, garbage in, garbage out. And the LLMs, at the end of the day, they are doing an embedding. They're doing this really magic approximation interpolation embedding function. And then they have a really neat trick of generating token at a time out the other side. Right? So, so it is garbage in, garbage out. And even though there can be emergent properties, there might be surprising things like, oh, this thing can generate Eminem rap songs. That's fantastic. But like, th at the end of the day, what they're really doing internally is they are creating this l very large embedding space and interpolating between them. So it's garbage in, garbage out. 
Um, I think we're out of time, but thank you all very much for coming. Um, and reach out to me on LinkedIn if you have any questions or want to follow up. If you're interested in any of our products or having discussion on how, how what we do might be uh, uh, you know, uh, able to partner with what you do, please definitely reach out. Um, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Peter Wang, Anaconda, and you'll find me there. All right, thank you so much.